Hey, Eli. Welcome back. It's the Behind the Well show. It's our 100th episode today. That's a large milestone, I think, for um, producing podcast and YouTube channels, I think. Because it's all about, when you do podcasting and YouTube, it's just mostly about consistency of providing content, consistently doing it. So 100th episode, that feels like a lot right now. And, you know, someday we'll do a 200th and someday a 500th, and it's going to be awesome every time. So when Molly told me this was our 100th show, I started thinking about this, and maybe Molly knows, how many radio shows have we done? You know, we've been live on WMT 600 a.m. for 14 13 years so it took us okay so basically every two years you're going to do 100 104. shows you're going to miss some here and there so yeah our radio show's probably got 12 to 1300 episodes no excuse me that'd be 100 per year yeah half of that yeah i mean we're close to, so we it'll, i'm excited to hit like a thousand on that show i think that that would be really really cool yeah so we'll do that in like four or five years yeah. And I, I mean, I don't see why we wouldn't. I think, though, the other kind of funny thing, when when we decided to start doing this show, I'm pretty sure Molly's confidence level in us getting a show done every week was quite low. And it's only gone up probably 5%. And, and for so. people that I don't know, Molly is the producer of the show. She does all the editing. She, she kind of makes this thing happen. Without Molly, there would be no show. Um so we want to thank Molly for everything she's done. And as she put together this outline, she wanted to look back a little bit at the 100 episodes and kind of take away our favorite moments. And she put some in here. And I think my most memorable moment of our show so far is when you asked me if the Internet was invented when I got married. That's probably the best question I've ever asked on I, the Behind the Wealth podcast. I, I couldn't stop laughing. I don't know how long I laughed for. And I watched, it's on our blooper reel. Maybe we can, Molly can splice the blooper reel in. But it, it was it was the greatest question of all 100 shows so far. Well, and the internet at that point was invented, but I don't think it was as robust as it is now. There's a lot more applications and things you can do with internet now than you could in, what, 2001? Or what year did you get married? 2002 be 20 yeah, years so 2002 year. i think it was pretty robust but yeah it wasn't on everyone's phone that they carry around no you're right well we all think that we've talked about this before everybody thinks they've had these little phones in their hands forever i think the iphone came out in 2008 it's actually a relatively new thing and people use it a lot um what, what's your favorite do you have a favorite memory or moment of the show Elias I, I remember when someone called you boring so that's what I was going to bring up my favorite and it's a two-part thing for me that my memory of that because one I got called boring in a comment from a listener and then there was someone else who followed up that comment they suggested a book that I should read and it was a book about confidence and for me I'm like I don't think I'm lacking confidence. I just think I have a overall demeanor that is fairly dry and boring. So like, can I control that? I mean, maybe a little bit, but not really. Cause a lot of it's just my natural personality. So then I remember thinking, wow, our listeners think that I just have no self-confidence. That is a great compliment towards me. <laughs> so I know who the listener was. He's actually a friend of mine. And then yeah, I know the who, other guy. I know him too, and I've talked to him on the phone and stuff because I've helped him with stuff. So. You know what was funny about it though? You actually got a lot of support on that that Facebook feed. People were like you can do this, Elias. It was, it was actually Go. the yeah. It's like the little engine that could. So Elias, there's a couple other I thought um, fun fun times in the show. One of them was when uh, I didn't cut my hair for a year, and we had the poll about whether I should cut my hair a lot, cut my hair or not. Yeah, and your pandemic hair was out of control. I think the poll overwhelmingly said you should get a haircut. Yeah, so I'll tell you the funniest thing about having that long hair is, you, you know our friend Armin. Yes. 6.30 one morning, he randomly calls me. And I pick up, he goes, did you call me, Roger? I'm like... Wasn't you, it a FaceTime You're call? right. It was yeah. a FaceTime. 
and my I literally just rolled out of bed and my hair was like sticking straight up like Doc Brown from from uh, Back to the Future. And I go, Armin, why in the why in the world would I call anybody or FaceTime anybody with hair like this in the morning? I mean, it was like straight up. And I, that was like the epiphany moment for me that it's time to get a haircut. And then the other time I knew it was time. My daughter came home after she went to get her haircut and she cut it like real short. She goes, Dad, now I have a haircut like you. I'm like, that was great. That was awesome. My, my wife actually was not thrilled about that. My wife could not figure out why she wanted to cut her hair short. And then she come, came home. She's like, Dad, I have a haircut just like you. And she was so proud. And then what, who's I can't believe I can't come up with the name, but the character on uh, the movie Wall Street, the um, the Gordon older Gecko. Yeah, you were starting to look like Gordon Gecko. You were turning into Gordon Gecko. I don't know about that, but I was going for the (laughs) slick back hair. Uh, Well, that's actually one of my favorite movies. I'm surprised you've actually seen that one. I forgot that. That's actually another good memory of the show is when we realized that you've never watched any movies. Like all the I'm catching up. I'm I've been watching movies. I watched uh, actually recently. I watched the old Top Gun, and then I went to the movie theater and I watched the new Top Gun. I actually like the new one better than the the original. I thought the new one was a better movie. I really want to see the new one. Um, awesome. A couple of facts, though, that people may not know. Uh, we had two episodes of this show that recorded in mid-2020 that never aired. I don't know why. We'll have to ask Molly. Apparently, we did a poor job. Um, and then the other other Probably. thing is we, we changed the name of the show two different times before we actually landed on Behind the Wealth. Uh, so the what f- were the – see, I don't remember that. What were the other names? Well, those are the names we didn't pick because they weren't good, and I don't remember them. I don't. I wish I, wish I remembered because I don't rem- I just don't remember calling the show anything other than Behind the Wealth Show. Molly, Molly probably has that fact data set somewhere. Right. Maybe she can come up with it. The first show we ever did that I ever did uh, was September thirtieth of two thousand twenty. So we're almost at two years doing it. Jonas is my first co-host and the first topic of the show I think is even still fitting today. The very first topic of our first show was how to build a personal media filter. Well, that, that topic is almost timeless because just look at this year, the, we have a bear market and if you watch too much financial media, it's easy to get excited about it. When we have a bull market, if you watch too much financial media, it's easy to get too excited about it. It's just always media is about entertainment, right? You got to get people to watch your show. So it can't just always be, you know, dry and subjective facts. It has to be entertaining. So it's always going to be an exciting topic when you turn the television on. Think about how excited people got when the S and P 500 was down 26% earlier this year. And if they actually hadn't turned on the TV, hadn't checked their statement, and they were coming in the office today, they'd come in and be like, oh, my account's down, whatever, 10 to 11%, whatever it is, whatever the S&P is today, they wouldn't be all excited. But everybody got in this huge upheaval three months ago. World's coming to an end, and media yeah, filter and we, is probably the number one thing that determines people's success in the investing game. Yeah, just blocking out the things. You, you can't control that and just block it out. It's all you can do. Your first appearance, Elias, October 7th of 2020, and that was when we were talking about elections and the stock market. And do you remember at that time? So, the, okay, that was the second episode, but for a long time that was one of our most viewed episodes. Now we get over thou- into the thousands of views every week. We're about 10,000 views a week. Yeah, but back then, you know, that show got like 105 views. We could look or 140 or something, and that was a huge deal. That we oh. got over 100 views. Or like 100 you know, people watched this. And we had four, four, four or five subscribers, subscribers at the time. That was awesome. Now, I remember that. Like the first, when we got 100 subscribers and then 1,000, and now it just keeps clicking and clicking and clicking. Yeah. But the first 100 was pretty exciting. Like, man, 100 people subscribed to this show. So one thing Molly thought would be fun if we did today is a game called Who Said It? So we're going to get to some financial stuff. We actually have 13 Habits. Uh, that are hurting people's retirement savings. We're going to get to those, but we just want to have a little fun today since it's the 100th episode. Um, I'm not sure how we're going to play this game. This is all in Molly's Molly's court. I'll let her take over with how we're going to play this. 
All right, so I am going to read you 10 quotes from past episodes of Behind the Wealth, and your job is to tell me who said it. Was it Roger, Elias, or frequent co-host Jonas? Dude, if we can't get Jonas's quotes right, we're trash because he says some of the most memorable stuff anyone ever says. Half of these have to be him. One of these has to be who has a spare tire. It, yeah, that has to be a that, quote. Right. All right. But Molly probably did a good job of throwing curveballs in there because she knows all of us. So. All right. We're going to let Molly go ahead and give us the quotes. All right. Quote number one. It's the strangest thing. The stock market is the only store in America that when everything goes on sale, all the customers leave. I know who said that. I think it's Elias who said that. Yep, I think you, you I defi- remember. You definitely stole that somewhere, but it's a yeah. great quote. I all mean, my good quotes are stolen from some other, all, someone else. Just think about that lens and thinking. That is one of the greatest quotes on the show. I mean, it's true. It's the only place people run away from when they're like, hey, by the way, it's 40% off today. Yeah, and you never hear any. You never hear anyone make a contribution and say, "Guess how much money I saved today." But if you go buy a pair of jeans, that's twenty five percent off. You bring them home and you go, "Guess how much I saved by buying these jeans?" Yeah, that that's a really really good one, Elias. You are both correct. That was Elias in episode five. Quote number two: We have people that come in and want to time the market. If you look at Warren Buffett, even he doesn't try to time the market. He just waits for the market to go on sale. I know. I think that's a Roger. I think this is Jonas. Jonas is he like, loves. He is long on Warren Buffett. It's his favorite person, Jonas. Roger is correct. Yeah, yeah. I knew it. If it's Warren Buffett in it, it has to be Jonas. Right. All right. The next quote. We have gotten into this environment where people believe the way to get rich, become a millionaire, and make it is through one stock one individual security, which is completely against the way you actually do this. That's a Roger. That's a Roger all the way. I I feel like it had to be me whether I said it or not because Molly's just trying to have a quality in the the quotes here. Yeah, that that one up the game. (laughs) That up the game right there. That up the game right there. That was Roger in episode 21. Next quote. There is so much financial advice today. It's almost mind-boggling. I, I think that's me. Mind boggling sounds like a Jonas word. You might be right. That was Roger in episode 32. Yep. You got them all so far. Have I? Quote number five. People are probably going to get tired of hearing us say this, but time in the market is a much greater indicator of success than timing the market. That's an, that's an Eli quote. It's Eli quote. That was Elias, episode 11. Quote number six, I have never met anyone in my years that have come back to me and said, I've saved too much money. That's definitely me. Yeah, that's a Roger. I stole that from Jeff. That was actually Jonas in episode nine. Wow, curveball, because you say that a lot. Well, we both stole from Jeff. That's why we say it a lot. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It was stolen from the same person. Yeah, you got it. There's a couple like key phrases that... I think everybody at this firm actually uses and a lot of them were generated from Jeff. He's got a way with, he's got a way with uh, putting things in a way people can really grasp, but that's for sure. I'm the chicken wing guy. I'm telling you right now, my bag of chicken wings used to be nine 99. Now it's 1999. Jonas. Jonas. So it made me a little grinchy over the holidays. Listen, this is Jonas. When the chicken wing shortage was here, Jonas was not happy about it. In and fact, his biggest complaint about inflation has been the price of chicken wings, not gas. Yeah, he was not just chicken wings, not groceries, just specifically chicken wings. So I'll tell you, like when I knew there was a problem, there's a place in Marion that I really like to get chicken wings from. And I called up. They're like, we don't have chicken wings anymore. I go, what are you talking about? They're like, there's a chicken wing shortage. We're not going to have them. I'm like, I was so disappointed because my wife likes to get carry out from this place a lot. And it's really the only thing on the menu that I like are their, their chicken wings. So that was when I knew there was a chicken so wing problem. I have a similar chicken wing story. And this is when I knew inflation was serious. There's uh, one of our restaurants. It's down in Czech Village. The chicken wings on the menu were market price. 
I've never seen that in my life. Yeah, I remember that. And you're a big chicken wing guy. Yeah, I try them everywhere. And that's when that's when it really dawned on me, okay, inflation is a serious deal. The chicken wings are going <laughs> to the market price, not just what they normally are. I'm, I mean, I've never usually you see market price for like the lobster, the crab legs. Yeah, stuff not they the gotta fly. Wings. Yeah, stuff they gotta fly in that was caught the day before. Yeah, this is frozen chicken wings. Yeah. <laughs> That was obviously Jonas. He said that in our Super Bowl episode number 73. Next quote. What the fee is doesn't matter. If you've executed a well-written financial plan and said, my goal is to have X amount of dollars in retirement, well, now we should just look at relative returns. That's got to be an That's easy me. one. That was Roger in episode 47. Quote number nine. Successful investors, that's the way they do it. At least the ones I know. This is an Eli Pretty quote. simple, I'm guessing me. That was Elias in episode 69. Successful investors, you like, you at like least, that At least the ones I know. All right, the last quote. The power of time is the greatest thing all investors have. That's Jonas. To me. That was Roger in episode 97. Oh, you just said that recently. So let me ask you a question, Molly. What's the prize? Oh no, what is this? <laughs> what is it? I have Elias socks. <laughs> is there, a, oh, is there my... two socks or just one? So, so what, the winner was going to get socks with my face on? <laughs> well, plaid planner. I mean, I wish we would have put the plaid planner on there. So I got to tell you a funny thing about these socks. So for Father's Day, the last probably three years, Megan gives me a pair of socks like this. Well, when we first had Blakely, it was just Blake. So I had a pair of socks with Blake on it and then gave me another pair to have Blake in London. And London's my three-year-old, Blake's my six-year-old. If I put on the pair of Blake socks, London goes, dad, where's my sock? And I have to go find a sock that has London on. So I'll wear like different socks because London insists that I wear a sock that she's on. It's kind of funny. Of course. Like a little bit of competition. So, well, I'm going to break these out. I think I'm going to wear these to the Christmas party. Oh, I think should. this would be a great talking point at the Christmas party. Apparently, Molly thought you were going to win. No, she probably knew you were going to win because I think her plan all along was I want Roger to win so he can get these socks with Elias' picture <laughs> on there. Oh <laughs> uh, well, let's get on to the let's get on to the money part of this. You know, things in the market are changing pretty pretty rapidly. We just had a CPI number that came out and less than expected. Markets seem to be moderating a little bit. What are you talking to people about, Elias? What are you telling people? I know I'm, I'm preparing people for more volatility. That's kind of what I'm doing with people. Um, it may be over, but I think if we set our expectation that there's going to be increased volatility for the next 6 to 12 months, I think we're setting the right expectation for people. Yeah, so I'm in that same boat. I'm right there with you. I still think that inflation is like the – key thing or the star of the show for the short-term immediate future. I mean, we just saw what happened. We had one report that came out that was better than expected and the market reacted very positively. I do know the there's starting to be uh, some consensus, at least through technical guys that um, use technical analysis to view the market there's a lot of talk that the market bottomed in June, but I think as far as expectations, I'm there with you. We should just expect more volatility and expect, um, just expect more pain. It's very, right now we could, you know, we're having a little bit of a rally, but if we have one inflation report that is worse than expected instead of better than expected, that could lead to some, uh, a lot of selling for consecutive trading days. I do believe that. So I don't know what show it was, maybe four or five episodes ago, we talked about how I, I could feel, you know, inflation moderating in my personal life on the things that I spent. And something very interesting happened about a week ago. I was on Facebook and, you know, I see what my friends are doing. And one of my friends sells real estate in Phoenix. 
And he posted on there they were going to have a poker run for four properties in his area that he's selling. And they were each million-dollar properties. And I have a family member who just purchased out in the Phoenix area, probably like probably 10 months ago, I guess, somewhere in there. Maybe, maybe it wasn't that long. Maybe it was February. And they couldn't find a place. I mean, things were selling in like two hours. So they went from selling in two hours to we have to have open houses again to generate attention. And a poker run. And a poker run. This is a big marketing event. Yeah, it's like a marketing event. So you're spending money doing it. So I sent my friend a question like, what's your housing market like? He said, inventories are ramping up and prices are coming down. It doesn't mean that there's a collapse in the housing market. It just means we're going to get back to normal inventory levels potentially sooner rather than later. You know, I had someone ask me yesterday, you know, I, I have some real estate I own that the market is the same way. Then I wrote up what the active listings were in 2018, 19, 20, 21, 22. And basically the active listings in this area were 80% less than today. And that's all you need to know. But the fact that inventories are starting to increase should ease some of the housing price pressures people feel. I talked with a gentleman who built my home five years ago. I said, hey, what are you seeing? He goes, and this is our local market in Iowa. Inventories are starting to increase. You know, building costs are potentially moderating. Price of lumber is down. So there's probably some level of easing in, in the, you know, in the inflation numbers. Um, and then that was reflected in the CPI, but I, I just kind of take my purview of what's happening based upon what's happening in life. You know, you can see what's happening. I saw gas at three dollars and forty three cents yesterday. Yeah, ga- yeah, gas is moderating. The Megan goes three. Not- I was with Megan. She goes three forty three. That seems reasonable, and that is pretty reasonable for gas. We we're up almost five bucks before. I, I drive a diesel truck. That was over five sixty at one time. Yes, and that's so gas. Um, I don't have anything scientific to back this up, but I do think grocery bills are less. I feel like we're buying the same amount of food and we're not spending as much at the grocery store. I do know a lot of the retailers, especially the bigger retailers, the talk of their inventory, there's going to have to be sales because they're just over, uh, they've, they've oversupplied themselves on certain items. Now, I don't think I have, and I've also listened to and heard some calls for deflation. I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around a deflationary environment, but I I I can, I, to me, I can absolutely see inflation moderating and I'm not, um, I'm not making a call that it's going to happen, but it almost seems the soft landing we're talking about pulling off it seems like we might actually be able to pull it off where at one time i thought there's no way way this is at this is actually going to happen i'm starting to turn the corner on those thoughts too so i'll tell you another interesting thing um local builder in the area threw an ad out there build and save on your new home and the first person who decided to build a new home pick your lot pick your plan claim your discount so new home builders are discounting homes now so we went from can't get a house we're discounting. So 15,000 off, 12,000 off, 10,000, 7,500 off. Like that was their ad that showed up in my feed just a couple of days ago. So I think it's really interesting what's starting to happen. And if you, if people were paying attention to actually the numbers, home building starts came to a screeching halt in like June. Once interest rates hit five and a half percent, new home builds, that was it. And part of that is people just not willing the shock of the interest rate and not willing to pay 5% when they're in at three and a half, they're just delaying building a house. And I mean, at the end of the day, if someone's going to build a wants to build a house, they're probably going to build a house regardless of interest rate, Mm -hmm. but there's going to be a period of time where they're like, look, I'm locked in at three or three and a half. I'm not paying five and a half to get a new house for a little bit of time until people get used to that interest rate. Once you get back used to normalize rates of four and a half to five and a half, 6%, It'll, you know, be normal for people. But for right now, people just aren't really looking to build homes. No, and I, I have a good friend of mine works in the mortgage business, and he's he told me this summer it, it was it wasn't like a trickle; it was like a light switch. Just all of a sudden, business got shut off. They're obviously still writing loans, but 
not at the same capacity and work uh, workflow that they were. Which all that helps moderate inflation. I mean, unfortunately, what will happen in, in that world is people probably are going to lose their job. You know, if you're processing, let's say, a thousand mortgage applications a day, how many people do you need to do that? And if you go to 50, how many people do you need to do that? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, and there, there, there might be some guys running an independent, you know, mortgage broker shop that maybe have to shut down for a little bit. It's part of the, it's part of business though. So, so Eli, Elias, I know we talked, talked earlier on, we're going to talk about the 13 bad habits that people do to kind of hurt the retirement savings. Number one, I, I think most people are probably guilty of this at some level. There was a study out there, Northwest Mutual put it out um, and said, Majority of Americans are optimistic when it comes to saving for their retirement. Said 23% of Americans are very confident and 37 are somewhat confident they'll have enough money to retire. Um, so I thought it'd be good when I saw this study to figure out what are the, the, the things that kill people's retirement savings. And the number one killer is spending now versus saving later. You know, the urge to spend the money now and just say, hey, I'll wait to save. It's totally reverse because you're losing out on the time value of money when you're waiting to save. You are. And that's why it's, and it, you can accomplish a lot more towards your investment portfolio, your net worth, your wealth, whatever you want to look at and call it by getting started early. Cause you can start with smaller amounts. And the other thing it allows you to do. And w I think when we talk about spending versus saving. I have never recommended to anyone that you save every last penny and nickel that you possibly can. I think you should be responsible with your money. You should have the prudent habits to build wealth over a long period of time, and you should enjoy your money for your entire life. Like, I don't think you should sacrifice lifestyle just to save a nickel. And the, to me, the only difference between people that do it and people that don't, it's just a priority. The people that build wealth over time, it's a priority for them. So they, they build in those habits and it's really, it can really be that easy and that simple. You just got to focus on a couple things and do them for a long time. I think number two is really, really important. And I know we do a very good job of trying to bring this to light to people when we're doing a financial plan for them but underestimating how much you'll actually need in retirement. You know, that we ask people all the time, well, you know, what we, we work on goals-based planning. So we say, hey, how much do you want to spend? And when you say, say that to somebody or ask that to somebody, the normal reaction is they just add up what their bills are. They don't include the fluff. Like I, I feel like the people that are setting themselves up for the best retirement are the ones who have an understanding of what they're spending and it's realistic. And, you know, we have people that'll come in here and they'll bring a spreadsheet like, well, this is what I spent last year. So I'm probably going to spend the same. They don't just say, well, here's my budget because right a budget and what you spent two different things. Most budgets yes. fail, right? So if someone walks in with a budget, well, that's great. It's your budget. What's all the stuff that killed your budget? Cause most people are blowing their budget up. Yep. Your, um, your coffees, that's part of your lifestyle going out to eat. That's a lifestyle thing, but that's what you're spending. Cause everything we do costs money. Well, I asked my mom when we were doing this, doing this, I said, well, how much they're getting ready to retire? How much do you guys, you know, how much you want to spend each month? And she's like, Oh, she told me like an obscenely low number, <laughs> $800 like, a month. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, what it was. It was like somewhere in there. I'm like, that's not possible. You guys have a camper. You're going to spend more than that in fuel in the summer. But the people aren't thinking about that. People also don't think about, hey, I might travel more the first five or seven years of retirement. Maybe I should build that in to this planning process. Uh, three, picking investments based on performance only. You know, all I'm going to say is ARC. If in 2021, you said, I'm going to buy ARC funds because they're up 40% over the last each year for five years. Well, guess what? It went down 80. And how, yeah. And how many, just recently I've heard so many people kind of like pat themselves on the back because they got into the high flying tech trade, but then they never sold. So now, you know, they're, they put 50,000 in, it went to 100 and then back down to 35. And now they're wondering what to do. 
Um, you know, and, th and that's what that is. You're just, you're picking your investments based on recent performance. And recently someone, we have a client who wanted an illustration of like our current portfolio and past performance, which we can do that through some different programs we use. But I just really highlighted to them. I said, look, the past perform we're positioning for the current market environment. So this past performance, is it like relevant? Yeah, kind of, but this portfolio has performed better, but we've made allocation changes on our current outlook. So it's not going to look that great when you look at the past performance. Number four is a really good one. Misunderstanding what diversification means. And I think the greatest way to explain this is at least a couple of times a year, we're meeting new people and they have this allocation. They think they're diversified. They own the 2030 fund, the 2035 fund and the 2040 fund. That, and yeah, they have that mix and they think the more they have means they're diversified, right? Well, they're not, they own the 2035 fund. They could have just bought one. That's not more diversification. Um, people just get it wrong. They think more is better. Or they're like, well, I don't want to have all my eggs in one basket, so I have one account at, you know, LPL broker dealer and one at Edward Jones and one at Morgan Stanley because, you know, I want to be diversified, but they own the same thing. Just at three different places. Yeah, that that's not diversification that's not diverse. that's either. Com that's complication. That, yeah, that's that what is it complication. Is. Or sometimes you see someone owns six different growth mutual funds and essentially all of those funds own all of the same things. So Just it's, yeah, you're differences. using six different managers. So you're diversifying your manager of your funds, but you're not diversifying through asset class. Well, and here's the one thing people, and people only think about diversifying by buying different funds. You know, we talk about people, what if you diversify by style of investment? Meaning you have some actively managed stuff, some passively managed stuff, some index stuff. So we win all the time. That's like the next level of diversification. Number five, Elias, saving only when the market is doing well. Well, you should save all the time. When the market's doing well, you actually just keep buying a higher price. It's, what was the quote you had? We just went through this. It's the best, one of the best quotes of the year. When the, uh, the market's the only store in America when everything goes on sale, all the customers want to leave. It should be 100%. So really, you should do more saving when the market's doing poorly. I know, you know, I practice what I preach. I've invested more money while the market's down than when I usually do. Like, I found opportunities to go invest more money. You know, certain things I do at the end of the year, I moved up because I wanted to try to take advantage of a buying opportunity. I don't know if it'll be there. You know, we did Roth yeah. conversions for people when the market was down 20, 25%. Did we do all of the Roth conversion? No, we are being conservative, right? But we started doing conversions when they're down. Those people are probably pretty happy that we converted funds when the market was down. Well, and, and six, seven, eight years from now, how happy are they gonna be about that decision that yeah, they and, made in 2022? And you know, that's, that's funny because most people think all we do is invest money. The things where we really add alpha and add massive benefit to people our small little strategies that, like that, that we can't just strictly quantify in how well an investment has done. Like the person who asked you, what's your performance? Well, this is the, the investment performance, but what about all this other added value and percentage return we've added through all the different things that can't be quantified? And there's really no good way to track it either. I mean, I wish we could. But it, yeah, it's just small things, partnering with someone's CPA and really getting them on a good conversion plan. Or we, we've had younger people call and they were maybe a little bit, hey, what should we do that the market's down? And we successfully talked in a bunch of people to increasing their contributions, make an off schedule contribution. Yeah. So all, all of those things. And certainly when the market's down, stopping a younger investor from becoming more conservative I mean, that, that's huge for their long-term success. Six, overreacting to market volatility. What do you think about that, Elias? Uh, th this, <laughs> one, th this one is easy. You can look at, um, you can look at historical performance. You, you, can just, you can look at so many things. I actually had a conversation the other day with a client I've been working with. I've been wanting them to not 
they're fairly conservative. I've been wanting them to rebalance into a little more aggressive portfolio because the market's down to take advantage of it. So I've been talking to him about it for a few months. And I think for me, and I kind of explain, I'm convicted in the capital market. So for me, I believe we should do this. And then I asked, like, do you really believe that businesses in America are going to get worse at making money? He said, no, I think they're going to keep making money and keep getting better at that. And I was like, so understanding that and then understanding that you are going to have to withstand some volatility. But as long as you believe that you should be invested in the market, it's a great place to build your wealth. For sure. That's a really good point. Number seven, putting your contributions completely on autopilot. I don't want people to get confused by this. We talk all the time about having systematic contributions. You should have that. What autopilot means is that you never change them. And what I believe people should do is you need to escalate your contribution each year. Here's why inflation was 9%. Well, if everything got 9% more expensive, but you left your contribution the same, technically you're contributing 9% less. That's pretty technical. Like you're contributing yeah. 9% less. So like my kids, college 529 plans, I have an automatic escalator on there. So each year it increases the dollar amount that I contribute. Everything automatically happens. Do I notice it? No, because I'm used to it happening. This is what I think people need to pay attention to. Don't just put on autopilot and never change it. And Jonas had brought a book to our attention. I think it was called Save More Tomorrow. This whole idea of, hey, when you get a pay raise, let's say you get a three or four percent pay raise, can you go and invest one percent more of that pay raise and keep three for yourself? Yes. And if you did that every year, pretty soon you're going to be at 15, 16, 70 percent of your income going into your retirement. And, and it phenomenal. was never painful because you never even noticed that never one percent was going on an annual basis. Yeah. Uh, eight, making only pre-tax retirement contributions. I think that I've probably talked more about Roth, Roth conversions and post-tax contributions more in the last two years than I ever have. And it really revolves around we've spent so much money at some point. We have to raise more revenue to pay for what we've done. It's just, you know, look, we just saw the, it's been all over Facebook. The IRS is adding 87,000 new enforcement agents. Whether they will or not, they've already accomplished what they wanted. Here's why. I had to talk with Casey yesterday. Do you think everybody's going to be extra diligent on their tax return this year, knowing that there's 87,000 more people going to audit them? Yes. They might not hire anybody. It might be the greatest headline of all time to get people to make sure they don't take advantage of the system. That's, Think about that's that. That's a Let really that good point. In. Yeah, that. And that was Casey. Casey said that. Well, they've already accomplished what they wanted. Because I was talking like, yeah, man, you better cross your eyes and dot your T's. Because my my accountant sent me something and said, hey, these are the things you're looking for. Let's just make sure you're doing a really good job. You know, like I write the name of who I had lunch with on my receipt, but I don't put it into my QuickBooks. You're like, hey, we're going to start putting it into the QuickBooks so that if and when you get audited. It's just right there versus me having to sort through a whole basket of receipts and making this giant mess, but just little things that make it easier. It was a ploy. I think it it's was a ploy. a ploy to just make people more diligent on their taxes. Well, yeah, that's funny. And I'm not getting political on. I'm just saying, yeah. you know, Roth is important. We like to be in the known tax bracket of zero at some point in time. Um, nine, not factoring in emergencies. You know, I, I think the people we work with, we really talk about having the emergency fund or a lot of these people are kind of beyond the phase of having to worry about an emergency. Yeah. You know, most of the people we work with are pretty, pretty responsible. And, you know, if they're younger, we make sure they have that emergency fund before they start sack, socking away a bunch of money. And well, yeah. And it's in, it's important because an emergency, especially for a younger person, you're building habits and then you have an emergency, it can blow up your situation. So you should be saving, but also, you should understand there is a certain amount of cash that you should have in your bank account for emergency purposes, vehicles, deductibles, all those kind of things. You just need liquid cash available. Putting too much money towards your house and car. I, I think in today's environment, it's really hard to, I mean, everybody's probably doing this. I mean, let's just be honest. People are probably with inflation paying more for their car, more for their house than they probably should. What was the study? What's the average car payment? It's like six or $700. It, it's a lot. And I'll just, I'll say this. 
I take my kids to the parks a lot around town. There's a lot of really nice vehicles out there. And I'm just looking around going, how can this many people afford all of these nice vehicles? It's seven year loans at 500 bucks a month or whatever it is. I mean, I was driving around and I saw a bunch of the new Escalades out. I mean, I was down on vacation. I saw like seven of these things and you can tell them because the front grill looks totally different. So you know what I did? I want to see how much these things are. 120,000 bucks. Like I like a nice car, but I told my wife, I'm like, I'm not sure I could bring myself to ever spend $120,000 on a car. Our friend, uh, our friend who uh, owns the car dealership. I was talking to him. He said, there's a new Chevy. That's almost a hundred thousand dollars. It's like some loaded Tahoe or Denali is like, it's almost a hundred thousand dollars for a car. The first house I ever bought was $70,000. Yeah. 1600 square feet. So, you know, people need to be careful of this, but I'm also in the camp that I don't want people to drive a jalopy, like have a reliable car. It just has to come at a reasonable cost. 11 ping for your kid's college education. Um, this is interesting. And I, I try not to interject too much when people tell me they want to pay for their kid's college. It's kind of a personal thing, whether you want to pay for your kid's college. But I think one of the people who sums this up best and maybe has the best quote since we were doing quotes earlier is Dave Ramsey. If you think back to what he tells people, you know, your kids aren't going to help you retire. So unless your retirement is on track, you shouldn't be saving for their college education. And I, and I remember an instance I had a potential person I was going to work with in this office. And I did a financial plan and I promised people I'll tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And I told them you need to invest X amount of dollars more. Otherwise this is not going to work for you. Like you're not gonna be able to retire. And he could have invested the extra money but he told me, he goes, I'm paying for my kid's college, so I'm going to make sure their college is paid for. And he didn't become a client. He didn't like what I told him. I just don't understand the rationale of I'm going to make sure my kids go to college. But I may not be able to retire because I do that. So I think that's where planning helps people. Hey, we can quantify if you're on track. So then, hey, this extra money, we can move to this college account for your kids. I'm right there with you. I've never, I've never met someone who is funding their parents' retirement. And so. if they are, it's not being funded well. No. Right? It's just enough to get them a place to live and get by. 12, tapping your retirement account for cash. Big no-no. Stay out of your retirement accounts. It's not your emergency fund. Establish a different emergency fund. There's no reason to rate a 401k, you know, I understand there's loans on a 401k. It should be the absolute last resort. The bank has turned you down. You are in dire straits. It's the last resort for funding. Yeah, t tapping retirement accounts for cash is just, that's to me, that's just a huge no-no. Shouldn't do it. Anyone who ever asked me about it, I tell them I would not recommend doing that. But if you decide to do it, ultimately it's your money. So I'm going to do, we're going to do whatever you want to do or whatever you need to do. And number 13, lastly, withdrawing money too quickly in retirement. I want people to think about this. If you take out 15 or 20% of your retirement account day one, it's no different than the market just going down 20%. You're hurting it just as much. And here's what's interesting about that. And you've heard me say this to people on the phone. They'll call up. I remember one person in particular, the market was down like 15%. And she's like, man, I just don't know if I can handle these losses she'd taken out like a third of her account six months early for something silly. Let's just put it that way. And I said to her, I said, well, you took out 35% of your account. You didn't think anything of it. Why are you worried about it going down 15? Well, because the going down 15, that's, that's yeah. your area. You should be accountable but, for that. But you know, the, people yeah. don't think about that. You can kill your nest egg with one bad move in that 401k or IRA or whatever you're taking it out of. You, you can, and there's, um, especially with goals-based planning, and when you transition to retirement, we can schedule higher distribution rates, especially early on for people. Um, but still, that has to be sustainable for whatever it is, 10 or 12 years, 15 years, and still sustainable for the life of the plan too. But it is possible to do, but it just needs to be a little more thought than, 
okay, well, I'm just going to take this out because I want it or whatever it may be. Elias, uh, great show. Pretty cool that it's our 100th episode. If anybody wants to go look at look or check out any of the podcasts or YouTubes that we've done, you can go to btwellshow.com. If you're looking to get a plan, btwellshow, btwellshow.com. It's got a little click here button, get started. Uh, with that said, do you have any closing remarks, Elias? I, I don't know if 100 is old for episodes on YouTube, but it makes me feel old and like I've been doing YouTube forever. And I, uh, everyone, thank you for listening to our program. <laughs>